Fakhaitu Dumelang, Sanbonani, Molweni, good evening. On behalf of the University of Cape Town, and especially on behalf of the students and recent alumni of UCT, I welcome you to the inaugural Roads Must Fall public lecture. This launch of the Roads Must Fall public lecture and launch of the Roads Must Fall scholarship. The Roads Must Fall scholarship, together with the lecture, were proposed to the UCT executive by our students, and with good reason. The protest action that led to the removal of the Rhodes statue on 9th April 2015 was initiated by UCT students, and so all the victories that come out of that period are students' victories. Staff and students became involved, whether they wanted to be or not, simply by being on campus, they were involved. Parents and alumni expressed their concerns and their support or condemnation for what they were seeing on the media. Lines were drawn that still stand out in bold relief today in discussions about higher education. It was a historic moment and that historic event did not stand alone. It triggered protests around the world against the power of colonialism, particularly in the UK and the USA. And since then, activism has continued in this country around other causes such as fees must fall, patriarchy must fall, outsourcing must fall, and many other falls. UCT could be considered the ground zero of the must fall protests in South Africa around higher education. And being a place of thought leadership comes with its own complexities, difficulties, and opportunities. This is not an easy process. Indeed, it is often a painful one. It forces us into spaces that can be challenging personally and collectively. So with this in mind, on behalf of UCT, we are grateful to all of you for the ways you have taken the brave decision to engage with uncomfortable ideas. The proposal by student activists to establish the Roads Must Fall Scholarship and an annual Roads Must Fall public lecture provides a platform for us to establish thought leadership that can lead us into the future, not just as an educational institution, but as a country and as citizens of the world. It is also a step towards healing and growth as a society and towards development of new voices in the discussion about the future of our country. We are a wounded society shouting at each other across the picket lines our wounds became much deeper and the deeper the wound is the more you bleed six years down the line we are still bleeding and our woundedness haunts us but here's the thing we we do not want to fall in love with our wounds as sometimes it happens with the wounded because if you, we fall in love with our wounds, we might just start feeling that all these wounds are not enough. And we may just start cutting ourselves deeper, forgetting when to stop. So with this launch today, it is time to acknowledge our woundedness and start finding each other again. One step in this direction is to listen to each other and to allow an exchange of ideas and feelings to arise out of that listening. It doesn't mean that we have to agree in each, with each other all the time, only that we commit to hearing each other. UCT's mission is to raise up thought leaders who can contribute to knowledge and socially responsive solutions to the hazards we come across as we develop South Africa's new democracy. To help put the Rose Must Fall movement into context, I want to introduce one of the alumni who was active in the movement at the time, Mr. Lindoku Klepatiwe. He's a research consultant at the Institute for Advancing Worker Justice and Legacy here in Cape Town. He's also a member of the Youth Policy Committee for the South, Africa, for, for the South African Institute of International Affairs. He graduated from UCT with a degree in politics, philosophy and economics in 2019. Mr. Patiwe, welcome. Over to you, Linda Kutle. I think we must thank the, univers the University of Cape Town's Council for agreeing to the proposal um, for the establishment of 
the Rose Must Fall Scholarship. Um, when I entered the Rose Must Fall movement, it was a very weird um, and very interesting time. It was on a Wednesday in 2015 when Kumani Matwele threw the pool uh, or the feces at the start of Rose Must Fall. And for me, it was a familiar yet unfamiliar smile. Familiar in the sense that I came from a place in the world or in South Africa where this smell was normal to me. But it was not normal because I was at the University of Cape Town. And I thought that this is not something to be. The 9th of March, when Tumani Makoele through the pool, signaled what I call a zero access for black politics at the University of Cape Town. Rose Must Fall is a movement of both staff, students, and at the time because of outsourcing workers, which at its very core fights for against the institutionalization of whiteness within the university and within society as well. It is a movement that forces itself to say that Black people must find a voice to, ex to explain um, their blackness in society and how they give voice. It, it is a movement that gave us voice within the institution. It was that which gave us speech to explain many of the things that we could not explain. It was that which gave us speech so that we can tell our experience. Uh, Pastor Cross Kusana once said that if we cannot see ourselves within the architecture uh, and the curriculum of the university, we therefore are not there. The Rome Must Fall movement gave us that architecture. It gave us that speech in which we can say that we are part of the thing. We are part of UCT. Um, it was able to, both within the university and outside of the university, to tell us the problematic about, the, about Black people, how Black people find themselves in the world. And I think that as the University of Cape Town, how we find ourselves now, um, and this this um, scholarship is a very good thing. We need to ask ourselves, though, in the sense that if the scholarship is for students in the University of Cape Town, we must ask the question to those who are going to apply to the scholarship. Can a road must fall be institutionalized? As a critique to the institution itself, uh, the question has to be asked whether the road must fall is an institution that wants to itself become institutionalized. And I think these are very interesting conversations that the, those who will be lucky enough to get the scholarship to ask as a, as a critique to the institution and how, and how the U University of Cape Town did the rose must fall. Many questions have been go around whether does the University of Cape Town have the right to put such a, pro a project in place. And we think that this is a good thing for those who are going to be applying for the scholarship to ask this thing. But it is proper to 
for ground. What does road must fall mean? What does road must fall stand for? What road must fall stand for is the fact that black people in society generally are not part of society. We can vote, we can all we can do all of those things, but we are not part of society. We and before 2015 at the University of Cape Town, as black students and black staff and black workers, we are unable to give speech to what we are experiencing. It was something that was there, but at the same time we could not explain it. And the throwing of the pool by Tumani Makwele on the 9th of March gave rise to many conversations on campus. Road must fall was a movement that says road must fall. And road must fall must not fall in the sense that the statue itself must fall. But the idea of colonialism, because we saw roads as the symbolic of colonialism, and was not necessarily a UCT thing, but because we had UCT, UCT was the starter of everything. But what Roma's Fall symbolizes, or what Roma's Fall fights for, is a complete decolonization of society as a whole, both at the localized level of UCT, but generally society, South Africa, Africa, and the world. And we came up with three principles. Black radical feminism, um, black consciousness, and pan-Africanism. Because we saw these three pillars as the center of a radical politic in society that can liberate society. What can society, how can society look better from what it is? And the question must be asked then, six years on, what has been the gains of the movement? And how has the university, which the movement was based on, can critique how has it gone in terms of the critique that was given by the Road Must Fall movement? There are some uh, success that we can claim in terms of the institutional, the, uh, re institutional reconciliation uh, process that happened at the University of Cape Town. What have, what have been the, uh, the process that happened afterwards? We don't know. Uh, but as an institution, Rome must fall signaled a very new politic in the university. It gave voice to those who were voiceless. Um, it gave a whole new politic. And I think that this, the formation of the scholarship is a part of the process that goes forward. It is up to those who take up the scholarship to ask these deeper questions about what, at an ethical level, how, how is it so that the very institutional as critiqued by the movement is the one that gives the scholarship? Can it be that within the institution itself and in how the institution is formalized, that we can have a radical politic in terms of black politics, a politic that seeks to completely obliterate uh, what we have as a society, gender-based violence, uh, 
the attack on black people institutionally, not only at the University of Cape Town, but also in terms of society as a whole. But I thank uh, the people that have been involved in making sure that this kind of scholarship happens without people finding different ways uh, of doing things, without uh, struggling with funding. But the point about the scholarship is giving funds and giving space to speak about what Rosemar Fall spoke about. How can society embrace these three principles that Romans Fall spoke about? Black radical feminism, black consciousness, and pan-Africanism. In context of what is happening currently within society generally, we have movements that have been gathering so much strength around South African exceptionalism, how can the scholars that come to be to speak against this thing or to speak for? Is the idea around putting South Africa first part of Pan-Africanism? How can we read the situation around the succession of the Western Cape with regards to the ideas that we are all black people? outside of whiteness? How does the question around the general critique that people have been giving of gender-based violence speak to the question of black radical feminism within the movement? And these are broad ideas that those who get to get the scholarship will need to speak to. But one critical point, uh, Prof, before I end, is can road must fall movement as a critique to the institution be institutionalized? What are the pitfalls around putting road must fall within the institutional ambits of the university? And I think these are interesting ideas that those who get to get the scholarship can speak about. Um, but as a Rosemars Fall movement, we are grateful to those who put up the, the call, and we are grateful to the university for accepting the call. Um, but it is an ongoing conversation around proper institutional critique of the world order, because you, the role must fall was a critique on the proper world order, how it is based in the current sense that it is. But yeah, we give thanks, um, and we hopefully, prof, uh, those that will take up the the call will give more to the movement. I thank you. Thank you very much, Lindo Kutle. I, I noted the questions that you raised and uh, they are questions worth engaging with as we move forward. And they're actually not just questions for, for UCT, they're for the, you know, the entire Follis movement. Can Rose must fall scholarship or Rose must fall as a critique to the institution be institutionalized? And I'm sure the, the task team that's been working on this um, uh, scholarship and the fund and um, the lecture will take up the questions. Thank you so much, uh, Lido Gutli. And I want to introduce uh, Mr. Detlin Daya. Uh, he's a postgraduate student currently serving as the president of the SRC. He completed his BA at, uh, here at UCT in 2020 and is currently leading the student body. Over to you, Detlin. Thank you very much, Vice-Chancellor. Good evening, everyone. Um, mine this evening is brief. 
uh, merely to offer a message from the Students Representative Council at this inaugural lecture of the scholarship and uh, on the commemoration of the six years that have passed since Rhodes fell. Um, having served in the last SRC, it's quite an honor to speak here, having witnessed the proposal of the initial idea for the Rhodes must fall scholarship um, being proposed the last SRC and how the scholarship was driven by students and now recently uh, finally and officially launched. The SRC simply is but one of the conduits to advance the struggles of students against the many forms of colonial violence that students experience in this institution. However, we must never forget that the revolutionary moment is not contained in, in the SRC, it is contained in the students. This is why the Roads Must Fall movement was a movement external to the SRC. It was a moment from the ground. It was a moment where students recognized that it is them who create and bring society into being. And through this realization, students endeavored to look to a world beyond coloniality. In the same way, the scholarship was a moment from the ground, not the SRC. We therefore thank the activists, the leaders, and all other students who played a role in the formation of the scholarship um, its journey from idea to what it is now um, and then who st stood with the project and saw it through to fruition. In paying tribute to the student activists who came before, we must remember that the fall of Rhodes was more than just the removal of the statue. The moment saw the rise of the three cardinal pillars of the movement, Pan-Africanism, Black Radical Feminism and Black Consciousness, and together these merge into the struggle uh, for the decolonial agenda. And similarly, this scholarship is a reminder that education is central to the decolonial agenda and therefore central to the Roads Must Fall project. In remembering Sibukwe, we must never forget that education to us means service to Africa. This should be the central driving force of the university. This should be the central driving force, driving force of the Roads Must Fall scholarship. The scholarship is a consistent reminder of our generational mission. It implores us to remember roads must fall in the subsequent movements and to contribute to a school of thought that takes us beyond coloniality. As I conclude, uh, I just want to want us to remember um, Fanon when he writes that I find myself suddenly in the world and I recognize that I have one right, that of demanding human behavior from the other. In the context of the roads must fall movement, it was this recognition that it fell to the students to demand human behavior from the other, the university in our context. Six years on, as we take stock of where we find ourselves and critique what has been done in respect of institutional transformation, we must never forget this right. I thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, Tatlan and Lindokutle, uh, as well as the team that produced the video. Well, as, as Tatlan and, um, and Lindokutle said, and all of us will say, the Roads Must Fall movement was not just about the road statue falling. It was the key catalyst in the decolon decolonization project. And whether we like it or not, the Roads Must Fall movement has changed the way we think about the production of new knowledge across South Africa, on the African continent and abroad. And activism inherent to Roads Must Fall has served to stimulate in-depth analysis on the decolonization of education and curriculum transformation, as well as the meaning of fallism as an institutional critique and the legacy of institutional racism. So launching the Rose Must Fall Scholarship is about continuing the work of decolonizing the curriculum and revisioning the role of the university in knowledge production. A particular contribution of the movement is what Detlin and, and, and and Lindo Kutle has been talking about, the interweaving of Black consciousness, Pan-Africanism, and black radical feminism as tools of analysis and social political lenses through which to view society. But why launch a scholarship? Well, the scholarship fund seeks to ensure that the next generation of activists, theorists, and scholars working within these fields of study have access to financial support for postgraduate studies that contribute richness and diverse voices to the decolonization of higher education. We started an appeal, and our appeal is for individuals with an affinity to the Roads Must Fall movement and for social justice organizations to consider funding these scholarships. And with this appeal, we have so far managed to raise a little more than 100,000 rands. And I urge all of you who are joining us at this lecture to consider giving to the Roads Must Fall Scholarship. L let me tell you, every little bit counts. And tonight, I want to announce that I pledge 10% of my salary to the Roads Must Fall Scholarship. So 10% of my salary per month will go to the Roads Must Fall Scholarship. Many of you would know that I'm already pledging, I already contribute 10% of my salary to a scholarship through which we fund black South African postgraduate students. 
So this is the second 10%. So which means every month, 20% of my salary will go back to supporting students. First, the black women, black South African women, postgraduate students, and now the roles must fall scholarship. UCT is also establishing an endowment fund to support future generations to access such scholarships. And we will start immediately with offering the scholarship next year, even if it is just one student who gets the scholarship, it will start immediately so that a student can start in 2022. We are committed to raising scholarship in this area. It is not enough to talk about roads falling. We want to see the scholarship that was ignited then growing and the people who drove it being at the leading edge of that scholarship. I want to move on to now launch the annual lecture. And to launch this annual lecture, we have invited Emeritus Professor Njabulon Debele to speak from his own deep experience of the struggle, of protest, of higher education and academic debate. He chairs the Nelson Mandela Foundation and the Mandela Rhodes Foundation and is the Chancellor of the University of Johannesburg. He is recognized around the world as one of South Africa's most distinguished writers, critiques, educationists, and public intellectuals. Barbara Nuspam of the Center for Conscious Leadership speaks of the remarkable threads that weave through his consciousness. Threads that emerge from his life as a South African who grew up in apartheid and has helped to shape our thinking as a democracy. Professor Ndebele was born in 1948, the year that apartheid was established in what was the then called Western Native Township in Johannesburg. Later, the family moved to the Nigel area. After graduating first in his class in English and philosophy from the University of Botswana, Lesotho and Swaziland, he earned a Master's of Arts in English Literature from the University of Cambridge in 1975 and a Doctor of Philosophy in Creative Writing from the University of Denver in 1983. He also studied at Churchill College, University of Cambridge, where he was the first recipient of the South African Basari. His academic career has been broad and distinguished in Lesotho and across South Africa. He held leadership positions in a number of universities, including UCT and in the South African University's Vice Chancellor's Association the Southern African Regional Universities Association and the Association of African Universities. He advised the government in broadcasting policy and school curriculum and chaired a government commission on the development and use of African languages as media of instruction in South African higher education. Professor Ndebele's writing and speaking career has been no less distinguished. He was a published poet whilst he was still an undergraduate. His first collection, writing collection, Fools and Other Stories, published in 1983, won the Norma, which is Africa's highest literary award. Bonolo and the Peach Tree followed in 1992, and the cry of Winnie Mandela in 2003. In the early 1980s, Professor Ndebele began speaking into South Africa's cultural, social, political, and literary identity. Those talks and articles were published in two collections, Rediscovery of the Ordinary, Essays on South Africa Literature and Culture in 1991, and Fine Lines from the Box, Further Thoughts About Our Country in 2007. In 1995, he was appointed President of the Congress of South African Writers and held that position for several years. He also chaired the jury for the 100 best books in Africa in the 20th century project. Professor Ndebele has received a total of 13 honorary doctorates from universities in South Africa, the United States, Japan, and Europe. He's a fellow of the University of Cape Town and an honorary fellow of Churchill College, Cambridge. He received the Lifetime Achievement Award from the National Research Foundation in 2009 
the Cape 300 Foundation Maltino Gold Medal for Services to Literature and Education in 2015, and the Arts and Culture Trust Lifetime Achievement Award in Literature in 2020. Miss citation for conferring an honorary degree on Professor Ndebele, Vets University said, the gift of Njabulo Ndebele is his dedication to the formation of a democratic culture and society that is committed to the production of culture and knowledge that is informed by a critical and self-reflexive imagination and that can facilitate the promotion of a humanist, generous and ethical sense of self, care and conduct among all South Africans. I am proud to present to you tonight this globally acclaimed academic and scholar, educator, creative writer, poet, struggle veteran and natural of African thinking, culture and identity. Professor Jabulu Ndebele, over to you Ndade. Thank you, Professor Pake, for your kind words of welcome. And I'd like to extend my greetings and gratitude to everyone uh, who is here tonight. And I feel extraordinarily honored by the invitation to deliver tonight's inaugural Roads Must Fall lecture. I have to confess, I have felt the immense weight of the responsibility it entailed. The Roads Must Fall events of uh, 2015 reverberated across the world. Since then, other events of similar significance have occurred, amplifying the global significance of what began with the termination of Rhodes's imperial gaze into the world, spread out before him from where his statute presence was mounted. And so he could endlessly contemplate subjecting that world to his imagination. An immediate effect at home was the Fees Must Fall movement. Beyond home, these events could be deemed to have occurred consequentially. For example, at Oxford University where Rhodes is commemorated. Other events were to occur independently in other parts of the world. But South Africans who witnessed the fall of the statue of Cecil John Rhodes could read consequential connections with events elsewhere which resonated with similar moral agency. The international resonances of the fall of Rhodes' statue were immediately evident. They would expand in their geographic and thematic features. I would like to ponder a little, a little more on these as background to my key messages of this evening. First, to state the obvious, that the few English, that few English people at the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th centuries expressed so vigorously the international character of the spread of unbridled capitalism as the economic system of choice around the world. And in particular, in Africa, as Cecil John Rhodes, the mining magnet and politician who became prime minister of the Cape Colony. In Africa, the continent, the possession of which gratified the egos of European nations, Rhodes would, as it were, have his own two countries, Southern Rhodesia, Northern Rhodesia. With his entrepreneurial and land-grabbing energy, nothing would stand in his way from Cape to Cairo through a continent where the armies of European nations had spread 
the forceful terrors of occupation and expansion. Meanwhile, in that other land, the United States of America, much of the drama of conquest and expansion had already occurred and completed. There, in 2017, just over 100 years after Rhodes died, and two years after his statuary fall from grace, US President Donald Trump would step onto his country's political stage to treat himself to national and global notoriety. But the history of the world would catch up with him when in 2019, two years into his presidency, the New York Times published the 1619 Project, named after the year in which Africans first landed on American soil in August 1619, 400 years ago. The intention of this extensively researched project was to place at the center of American national story, the contributions of black Americans to the economic success of the foundations having of the country, having effectively laid very strong foundations indeed with their lives. The accomplishment of this project in extending the American public's awareness of how slavery defined the character of their society was, in my view, enormous. That was well before George Floyd's public murder, the harassment of Black Lives Matter protesters, and President Trump's moral indifference to their message and the history contained in it. The vast expanse of history though, and the specificity of, of contemporary moment were brought together and exemplified for me, as at the time I watched the YouTube video of James Baldwin's atmospheric declaration at his historic Cambridge Union debate with William F. Buckley in 1965, and as you heard, eight years later, I was to be a student at Cambridge. The motion for debate was, has the American dream been achieved at the expense of the African Negro? Making clear at the, that the American dream had indeed been achieved at the expense of African Americans. This is what James Baldwin said, I picked the cotton and I carried it to the market and I built the railroads under someone else's whip for nothing. He could easily have added, and there has been no statue that commemorates my hard work. Instead, all that hard work end me. Contempt, loathing, debasement, hate, perpetual suspicion, and residential isolation and invisibility, not only in the black ghettos of the United States, but also in the sprawling townships and slums of Johannesburg, Cape Town, Nairobi, Lagos, Dakar, Kinshasa, ev everywhere in the world where capitalism flourished at the expense of people who served it for nothing and for which they had to no option but to return every following morning for the next pittance. And so it came to be that during President Trump's tenure of office, George Floyd, who like James Baldwin, had picked the cotton, had carried it to the market, and had built the railroads under someone else's whip for nothing, would have, have his life smothered 
in a public matter by a representative of a law and order institution, they are not only permitted the random and gratuitous killing of black men, but incarcerated millions of them in jails that were run as corporations. These massive jails are buildings that visually insert themselves into the contemporary public as forms of self-commemoration. They commemorate in real life an economic system so efficient and resourceful in its disregard and disrespect for the lives of people whom that system has historically put at the bottom of an entrenched system of racial hierarchy. To those that benefit from these visual economic obscenities, such prisons are monuments of heroic business resourcefulness, celebrated annually in mammoth profits that depend on how many more Black Americans will be arrested and incarcerated in terms of profit projections. So we, are, we can contemplate another statue, this time of an American police officer, his hand in his pocket, his knee on the neck of a distressed human being, frozen in a live statue that depicts a man whose self-assurance is solidified at that moment in his conduct at what he had been trained for and procedurally permitted to do to the kind of people who built the United States without due recognition, even recognition for having suffered for it. I end this segment of my talk with another international moment, COVID-19. Of this, I will let the Secretary General of the United Nations speak it on his, in his own words at the 2020 Nelson Mandela Annual Lecture. His words are structured and read like a poem. COVID-19, he said, has been likened to an X-ray revealing fractures in the fragile skeleton of the societies we have built. It is exposing fallacies and falsehoods everywhere. The lie that free markets can deliver health care for all. The fiction that unpaid care work is not work. The delusion that we live in a post-racist world. The myth that we are all in the same boat. Because while we are all floating, in the same sea, it's clear that some of us are in super yachts while others are clinging to the floating debris. So what is common then between Roads Must Fall, the Project 1619, Black Lives Matter, James Baldwin debating with William Barclay, the public murder of George Floyd and COVID-19? What they mean is yet another attempt by oppressed people to, leave the, to lift the heavy veil of the world ignorance of white supremacists who blinded by their profits are unable to and do not want to see and know how they have debased and devastated the human and the natural landscape for people in the world that don't look like them. Drawing on the work of Charles Mills and his reference to world ignorance as what he says, the epistemology of ignorance, Clarence C. Gravely in an article titled, How Whiteness Works, the Journal of the American Medical Association and the Refusals of White Supremacy lists what he calls five white supremacist refusals. One, there is the refusal of the other's humanity 
and tolerance for perpetual violence and exploitation. Two, there is a refusal to listen or acknowledge the experience of the other. Three, there is the refusal to confront the history of racial oppression and the ways it continues to shape the present. Four, there is the refusal to share space which takes for granted the segregated residential and occupational spaces that foster white ignorance. There is the refusal to face five, to face the structural causes, particularly the political economic structures of white supremacy. Now, such refusals in my experience tend to characterize the relationship between the so-called races in which the oppressed race will tend to know far more about the oppressor than the oppressors would ever know about them, even as they may claim superiority and a knowledge of all things. This is because the oppressed were compelled, forced to travel to work in their homes businesses, factories, and institutions of their racial tormentors. It is there that the oppressed got to see through the weak armor of self-delusions of superiority in the day-to-day -day of just people being themselves without the masks. It is a precarious psychological moment in which mutual exposure occurs that risks the unmasking of false superiority to the knowledge of supposed inferior beings who at those moments realize that the superior beings are not that special as human beings. And that's the kind of exposure that would never be allowed for too long. And it is such intense psychological interactions on a daily basis that led to what was called in my days, petty apartheid, understood as needless banal acts of cruelty, which being always experienced as brutal by the oppressed were never petty. The day-to-dayness of such psychologically fraught moments could lead often to a very grim truth, which is the mutual pretense between the oppressed and the oppressor that the world is indeed made of inferior and superior people. And in this way is the threat of the loss of a job averted and the self delusions of superiority continued into the next day. So buttressed by the existential assumption of the world of the oppressed is benighted in ignorance, white supremacists remain oblivious to the depth of ignorance into their own lives that have been encased in a locked vault of their own making. This of course is not true of every white or black South African, nor of all white people in the world. And indeed, we know that in the wake of the Roads Must Fall movement and of the, all the other things that happened in the United States, statues came tumbling in the UK, they tumbled in Belgium and in other countries. So, if you want to write a novel on this intriguing, intriguing human situation, I may just have provided you with its synopsis. It is this that leads me to express a hunch. This hunch comes with an invitation. It is an invitation to co-create the story of South Africa's future, the future of the African continent, and all those Africans 
who were forcibly taken away from their homes to toil for others in foreign lands for nothing. But when they did, their toil became the source of their own sense of ownership of that world. So when the people, the people in dinges cross the Mediterranean, they are following the toils of their ancestors that led to the enrichment of Europe. That community spread around the world. It is now calling for a future in which it seeks to realize itself, free from the enforced concealment of their human worth. It is wonderful to feel a part of that emergent human movement today, a quest for the regrounding of the fundamental worth of our humanness. But let me come to my hunch. It comes directly from the central question of this evening. What will rise after the fall of Rhodes? It's a rhetorical question. But there is a part of the question that makes me somewhat uneasy. So let me clear the ground before I proceed. I want to be clear that I do not intend to dwell this evening on the statue of Rhodes nor on its fate, nor do I intend to be preoccupied much with the Euro-American world whose riches Rhodes helped to build through extractions of wealth that still go on to this day. The corporate culture created by Euro-America has taken the world to the brink of environmental degradation. My preoccupation with Euro-America, enforced as it was, has not been an inconsiderable, inconsiderable part of my life. But I have come a long way and have no desire to continue to breathe in such a world. The world I want to breathe in is the one many of us have been able to create until perhaps this moment, now, when the conditions have arisen for me and you to create it. I want to breathe in a world that we now have to create. I have a hunch that up to 70% of South Africans or even more of all backgrounds belong without knowing or acknowledging to a cosmopolitan community they have yet to visualize and to experience. Yet, I believe they feel its vibrations tugging at their intuitions. It exists only as hope and the intuition that something has been ending and is now ending, but it is not quite clear what it is that is about to begin. This cosmopolitan community is profoundly restless and happy with the present moment, feeling deep inside of them the pressure of a future they sense but are unable to visualize despite a constitution that would enable them to achieve it. So the question, what is the content of life which in the achieving of it could be facilitated by the South African constitution admired in South Africa and around the world. My hunch is based on a historical fact South Africans tend to forget. It is that when white South Africans held a referendum on the 17th of March in 1992 to give their government a mandate to negotiate with the ANC, close to 70% of white South Africans gave their government that mandate. I do not think when the criticisms fly and the angers fly that this outcome is sufficiently acknowledged and accorded appropriate historical weight. They chose finally to begin a new journey into the future with their black fellow citizens 
whatever the merits or demerit, the merits of the outcomes of the enabled negotiations, the fact is our future was negotiated, not fought over, because everyone acknowledged the potential destructiveness of a racial civil war, which would guarantee a bleak future to all, not discounting the fact that a struggle of over a century does result in fatigue and tiredness and a desire for something new to happen. But it is also to be acknowledged that many lives were lost in the in-between. So the complexities of that outcome are part of the story of a still emerging country that we must all continue to write. And now I draw towards my conclusion. I share some thoughts about the content of the life that could be envisioned. As a conceptual background, I express the view that the life of nations, in the life of nations, misfortunes of all kinds in particular, those that lead to wars between nations and, and ethnicities, and families in local settings often lead to congealed behaviors which viewed against the future perspective can either confine or liberate. It is in real life calibrations between confinement and liberation that the future unfolds. For us, after a century of struggle, the desire for freedom finally removed undesirable confinements. Some social processes take long to coagulate into their either their worse or better forms. This perspective leads me to the following understandings. First, I believe that we have evolved into a cosmopolitan country, which is part of a cosmopolitan continent, often described as the most culturally diverse continent in the world. I make the bold assertion that if we want to unbundle what was summarily divided up in Europe in 1885, the cosmopolitanism we have evolved into be considered a foundational value for the future of our country and our continent. It does not have to change the meaningless borders that retain a former reality, but it can make them wither away. And I will speak to the South African experience as I have understood it by example. The cosmopolitan is not synonymous with the global. The cosmopolitan is interactive. The, co the cosmopolitan recognizes the other. It is not intimidated by the strangeness of new people that come along on the road of life. It is open-minded. It is respectful. It is open to community. It is thoughtful. It is empathetic. These values are a stark contrast to the harshness of the past that we have come from, that divided us into, into little entities hidden away in bus bantu stands in our dormitory townships. Coming back to our the experience that I wanted I referred to. Once the British had defeated everyone in this part of the world, they began to administer conquest for their benefit. A great population dispersal began that even King Shaga would not have imagined. Hundreds of thousands of the descendants of those who were dispersed by Shaga across the entire subcontinent of Africa converged the gold mines and the industries of South Africa. 
in congregations that gave effect to the first multinational, multicultural, multi-ethnic world envisioned by the founders of the African National Congress. It gave birth, some analysts have said, to the first working class population in Africa. The winds of history gave momentum to the vision of the founders of the African National Congress that they would never have envisaged. Life among the dispossessed was never to be the same to this day. As a consequence, my childhood friends and I easily switched from one language to another in our community interactions. Speaking several languages in my hometown was a common experience across many other townships throughout the Gold Reef. We, all South Africans, have the capability to speak at least four languages of, of, of this country in various degrees of, of competence and enable in real terms the cosmopolitanism that has become so entrenched in us. In our daily lives, we coagulated into a community comprising people, not only from other parts of Africa, but also from neighboring countries. Some coming all the way from Malawi. If you go back to the days of Fort He, some came all the way from Kenya, from Uganda, up north in, the, in, up in, in East Africa. I remember all this with an affectionate memory. I remember too that the small class of former traders, teachers, nurses, social workers, priests from various religious traditions, home-based artisans, factory and domestic workers interacted across class very easily, living side by side in the different homes. And I believe that it is possible then, when we talk about redesigning of townships and new special environments, to design environments that accentuate contact among residents across multiple potential social barriers. And that such an environment does not have to be modeled after our current legacy of township lives. Yes, we built a lot of new townships uh, since 1994, but they were the same difference. In fact, we have left untouched the special design of South African landscape and the townships that were designed as dormitories. I can list more examples, but they all come to a single point of convergence. What is it that we do for ourselves as a people, us as the center of gravity, not a satellite nation or continent settling in the periphery of other people's visions, but as a focus of our own constitutive, of our efforts, constitutive of our collective being. When we do this, we draw creative boundaries in our interactions with other nations and continents, particularly those with whom we have had a history of an equal relationships. We will know in these negotiations what it is that we can never give up on. We will not give way and we will know what is negotiable and we will know what it is that can be given away. And we will develop our own standards of what it means to live on the African continent. This reality demands that we take care of ourselves. This, the wholeness of ourselves, is what should rise when some statues fall. Then we can visit those statues in the museums where we can contemplate them appropriately away from the heraldry of permanent public displays. I now end on a metaphorical note. If you want to contemplate the assertion of self-worth, 
where the wholeness of that wealth, that wealth was universally denied and then exploited. Take time to watch Viola Davis in Netflix move, My Rain is Black Bottom. You will see there how the systemic destruction of human beings by other human beings has been so suffused into the day to day in the United States. You will be entranced by the gifted blues singer who kept taking in the pain until an opportunity arises for vital self-assertion in those moments when, in order to affirm herself, knowing that her white managers will bend to her will just because they needed that voice desperately. And she would say to them, I am more than my voice in a business culture, totally blind to her humanity. But so many others took the pain. They just took the pain. They are a legion in African history who took the pain so that they could live for another day. Ma Rainey did. So did Miriam Magab. So did James Baldwin, Nat Nakasa, Blok Mudisane, Ken Tamba, Eskia Patel. So did Zora Neale Hurston. So did Noni Jabavu. So did Mahatma Gandhi. So did Martin Luther King. So did Robert Sobugwe. So did Toussaint Louverture. Louverture. So did exiled King Kajwai, who witnessed the dismemberment of his people by the British. So did Nelson Mandela, whose principled optimism never dimmed over 27 years of incarceration. These names are but a sample of artists and leaders of great vision among the oppressed who had looked into the mark of human suffering that surrounded them and were still able to distill from it all transcendent value. They and their people have had to live in and with the filth that was thrown only once at a statue. Through the artistic and political vision, these remarkable people could express the truths of their witness with the power of myth and wrestle with the complex truths of good and evil and the capacity of those truths to accentuate the messages of human rights for all, freedom for all, equality among people, and the universal respect among peoples. Here is what Nicole Hannah Jones, she who put together the 1619 project wrote in a bold statement. She writes, our finding ideals of liberty and equality in the United States were false when they were written. Black Americans fought to make them true. Without this struggle, America would have no democracy at all. The oppressed are indeed the future of transcendent value. These words re resound profoundly with Paulo Freire, whose book, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, I read as an undergraduate student in Lesotho in the early 70s, and its insights have lived with me intimately to this day. Somewhere in the book, Freire writes, this then is the great humanistic and historical task of the oppressed to liberate themselves and their oppressors as well. End of quote. So let your essence be the source of your creativity. That is what will give energy and shape to our economy, to our politics, to our religion, to our culture, to our schools and universities, to our communities, and in our interactions with our fellow citizens and with other nations. That is the wish 
and the dream I have and which I live and share with you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Professor Debele, thank you so much for sharing with us your insights into the meaning of protest in democracy, and especially in higher education. Earlier, when I was introducing you, I referred to what Barbara Nospam, how Barbara Nospam um, uh, speaks of you, and when she says, uh, talks about the remarkable threats that weave through your consciousness. And in your talk this evening, you have given us a glimpse of those threats. They emerge from your life and scholarship as a South African who grew up in apartheid and helped to shape our thinking as a democracy. Your talk this evening illustrates the timeliness of continuing to discuss the Roads Must Fall movement because it was a signal to us of what the world is beginning to understand through the effects of climate change, the pandemic, the widening gap of poverty and inequality, the epidemic of gender-based violence, the Black Lives Matter protests of last year, and the testimonies we have been hearing in the trial of the men accused of killing George Floyd. The value system that has brought the world to this point is flawed and unsustainable. Our survival as human beings requires us to revise and uphold life-affirming values. And Prof. Ndebele, you, 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 you have challenged us to consider this question. What redeeming values will drive the next world and where will they come from? Years from now, children may ask us why it was necessary to remove the statue from the UCT campus. With guidance such as we have received tonight, I trust that we or those who come after us will offer those children a way to think about their own role in the democracy they will live in, and opportunities to think through and discuss differences of opinion, to create peace and justice in their world, and to affirm the humanity of every individual. Thank you so much for offering yourself to this our project collectively. Thank you to everyone who joined us tonight, especially to the students who spoke, Detlan and Lindo Gutle. Thank you very much. Good night. <laughs>